Ken Calopy here with uh, George Stahl and uh, Next Play Academy. We're going to try something new here today. Um, we're here with head coach John Brandon um, talking about the mental aspects of the game here at Next Play. Our, our mission is to, to help players uh, become mentally tough um, in a number of ways. Talk about mind, body, and craft. Um, and this is the focus on mind. So we're here with, again, uh, Coach John Brandon. And Coach, thanks for, for joining us. Happy to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So, George, go ahead, man. Well, we got a few questions here for you. The first one we got here is um, so many coaches uh, put a lot of hours into being a successful program, right? And, um, you know, just like, you know, any other school, what are the most important things to you that separate that separate yourselves from other competition? You know, whether it's just in your conference or just any other school? Yeah, it's a great question, George. I think you got to, you know, anytime you're in an organization and there's competition in every organization we're in, you know, whether it be the business sector or sports profession collegially or at the grade school level, high school level, you're always trying to separate yourself from the competition. And I think you can do that in several different ways. For us, it's our culture. You know, that's, we, we talk about what are we most passionate about and what do we want to be the best, most, the best in the league at. We're most passionate about the total development of the player. What we need to be the best in the league in is the development of our culture. And our culture for us is, you know, really trust, toughness, and sacrifice. Those are the things we talk about on a daily basis. So that means we may not be the, you know, out-recruit everybody, uh, may not out-coach everybody, may not out-execute everybody. But from a culture standpoint, we want to make sure that we have that in place, and we want that to be the separator. Now, there's also smaller things that go into building a culture that you have to have the resources and different things to do. But uh, that's really what we, uh, we count on here at Cincinnati Basketball to, to do. Okay, so trust... Toughness, Toughness and sacrifice. Sacrifice. Yep. Is there anything? I, mean, I know that there is, but what? What is just if, you know one or two things that you do specifically to instill that from day one, from when you met the team, from you know yeah. from the preseason. Great right? question. So what we do is we do uh, uh, we have our entire organization meet once a week to go over our core values, and we have a standard for every core values, and that can be anything you want it to be. You know, for us, it's different things. Uh, but it's one standard for each core value that our guys know that those, you know, like toughness, we don't go to our knees. We always stay up. Uh, if the guy hits the ground, we pick him up. That's our standard for sacrifice. So different things like that. Uh, but communicate with our team, letting them know what the standards are. And, you know, as a coach, one of the things we've got to challenge ourselves on every day is the first standard you walk past is the next standard you have to set. So you can't have too many standards, but if you have standards, you've got to live by them. Because if you don't, the moment you walk past it and ignore it, then you're setting a new standard. And uh, that's important for what we do, and I think it's important in any culture. Okay, that's good. That's uh, good. Just real quick, uh, kind of change gears on recruiting. So, you know, that there are a lot of great kids out there, mm -hmm. um, high school players, and they want to play at the Division One level. Um, what separates them when you have a kid who's very two two kids who are very similar? Uh, what are specific things you look for? From those players when you see them in AAU games, high school games, that's their motor. You know how hard they play. You know if you're dealing with the same talent level, you know are they their motor? How hard they play? Are they coachable? You're talking about just valuation on the basketball court. Motor, how hard they play? How coachable are they in their body language? Hmm. Will tell me everything. And then the other piece is off the court is the character piece, the academic piece, and the ability to to get over. We we call it getting over yourself. The ability to not make it about you. Uh, you know, the San Antonio Spurs have a motto, we sign guys that have gotten over themselves. If all it is is about you in every instance, then, you know, whether it be because your parents have made it about you or because you decided to make it about you, then I'm probably not going to recruit you. I'm probably going to go in another direction. Right, right. So you bring these guys in. Um, we talked about this a little bit before. How do you get them to buy into the, the mentality aspect of the things that you're um, that you're pushing them, they may not have learned at a young age. So I, we take the mentality, uh, Kenny, that you learn it a, over a long period of the time all of a sudden. Now you have to really think about that. You learn it over a long period of time all of a sudden. So if you stay consistent and say the same thing 5,000 times instead of 5,000 things one time, mm -hmm. that's how you learn. You're consistent with your message. Your staff says the same thing. Your vernacular is the same, and the guys hear it over and over and over and over and over again. And they're going to look at it like, ah, coaches, but it'll, it'll sink in. And what happens is your, your guys come back after their fathers and their husbands and their coworkers, and they're saying the same things, and they have a chance to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's a 100% guarantee everybody's basketball career is going to end at some point. That's right. Um, so what are, what are your more proud moments as a coach when, when they're 
not in your locker room? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's, it's an easy answer. You know, we won a bunch of championships in Northern Kentucky, and everybody thought it was the first NCAA tournament in Northern Kentucky history, or it's becoming the head coach of Cincinnati, and all those are unbelievable and phenomenal. But being invited to my players' weddings, or you know, getting a phone call like you know we're pregnant, yeah. uh, that's the best. Yeah. That, that's the stuff. That, that's the stuff that no parade or no ring can take the place of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good feeling. Which kind of a different sort of question about this, and I don't, I don't know what the answer would be. So, and that's important. That's what's important to you as a coach, and that has to be, you know, as former coaches, you're right. That's that's such a good feeling now. The fans, when they, you know, as a typical fan, are like, you know, we want our team to win, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, you're unfortunately judged by wins and losses mm -hmm. and everything, and, you know, or how well you do in a tournament and whatnot. Sometimes a lot of coaches are. And so how, and I know you said it all starts with the culture, and how, I guess my question is, is how do you kind of balance in your mind the you know, I guess when you lay your head on the pillow at night, you know, what is the most important thing to you? I, I Like you said, I know that that's the most important thing to you, but how are you balancing your mind the kind of stress between the two? Yeah, I think, I think, what you say, yeah, I think you have to divorce yourself from the outcome. I think okay. you, gotta, you, you can't be, we're an outcome-oriented business. We're an right. outcome-oriented society. But you have to divorce yourself from the outcome and understand it's the process in place that gets you to your outcome. So if you get up every day and do the same thing and it's, you know, hard work's a relative term, which you consider hard work and I consider hard work two totally different things. Yes. But if you go every day and you're doing the right things, you put the right people around you and you know you're doing the right things every day and you're, right, you may not see the results, all of a sudden you reach a goal. Yeah. You reach a goal and you're, you're like, wow, I got here. Now, what, you set another goal. Mm -hmm. and, but you divorce yourself from the scoreboard yeah. and you divorce yourself from the goal after setting it and live in the process. Right. That's good. That's good. Now, and... You were obviously a really hard worker. I mean, I remember when you were a player, you know, worked, you know, your tail off. How has that um, helped you in coaching? Have you, has your mindset changed in any sort of way? In, in a good way, bad way? Yeah, no, it's good. Coaching, you have to look at things differently because you have four, 13 different personalities on your team. Right. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, hard work's relative. So you take the work ethic you had as a player and you put it into your coaching career. You take the expectations you had as a player and you make sure that you understand where each one of your players comes from and try to get the most out of them. It took me a while in coaching to realize that because I didn't think, well, if I worked so hard, why aren't you? And you know, some guys are just more talented. Some guys do it in a different way. I think there's different ways to be successful. I've learned that in coaching. We tell our guys all the time, we're not gonna, we'll treat everybody fairly, but we're not going to coach everybody the same. And that would just be insane to do that. So we try to find the personality of a guy through sometimes personality tests, other times through just spending time with them, and try to figure out what's the best way to get them to perform at their highest. And I think sometimes you have, well, not sometimes, all the time as a coach, you have to take your ego aside and the willingness and the need to always be right. Um, it's kind of like being a husband. When you pull up to the, your house, there's three things you should say before you walk in your house. Give up my need to be right, give up my need to be right, give up my need to be right. All right. If you say the same thing before you go to practice, you might have more successful team. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> my my wife might watch this. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Wait, and one more question for you. Yeah, you go ahead. One suit. And you say, you know, you learned a long way, some of those things, you know, being a coach. Is there anything that you do specifically to, you know, to help yourself, to for you to grow, as continue to grow as a coach? Is there anything that you kind of really what is reading books or some podcasts I mean anything yeah. that you do to help yourself grow as a coach I wish it was reading books I don't do a good enough job of that what I what I do is I've got kind of like a kind of like a uh, if you would a kind of board of trustees that uh, help me like people that I call upon that I can that'll tell me the truth that have watched our teams play I'll bring them into practice our guys won't even know they're there and they'll watch and give me thoughts uh, I use a sports psychologist that I'm really good with. Uh, I have a CEO of a major company that teaches me leadership things, and we talk through things, talk different ideas. And that growth takes place year-round. Um, right. And I just sit and listen. And, and, and my staff challenges me in a lot of different ways as well. You don't want to hire people around you that are different than you have different perspectives. So, And sometimes that's difficult in a leadership role because you're, you're constantly consumed about getting your message across, right? To, to your team and your organization and to your people and sometimes you forget that that message needs to be crafted in a way that's maybe more articulate more or easier to understand and uh, you won't you can't get that perspective if all you do is be consumed with your own thoughts 
Uh, I think sometimes you got to rely on other people. You talked about the uh, sports psychologist and, and yeah. uh, working with him. Um, how often do your players interact with him? What are some other things that you've done? I know uh, Michael Buter talked about um, the Navy SEAL training coming mm -hmm. in. Um, and obviously you get a mental training every day in practice. You, know, mm -hmm. you guys are meeting once a week too in classrooms. What's the balance there, um, whether it's focusing too much on the mental side of yeah. it or, or not enough? It's interesting. Coach Donovan taught me one time. Told me one time. He said, "You know, he, the thing he learned in coaching was he was putting so much time into the practice plan, and then he flipped it and put more time into the guy's mental makeup before practice." So think about that. Because listen, we, we you know as coaches at our levels, we play what thirty games a year. Okay, mm -hmm. I mean that it's, it's like a one to five practice game to practice ratio. Right. So I would I would urge coaches to spend more time getting their young men in a mental state to practice than their actual practice plan. Right. Because you're gonna find you're gonna get way more out of practice instead of being frustrated that you didn't get through the whole practice. Right. Right. So that would be my challenge to coaches out there. It's a challenge that I have to make every day. And thank God at my level I have a staff that I can say, all right, you guys need to make sure the team's mentally ready. And not every level has that. Yeah. What is it, is there anything that you, do you wanna share that you do? And well, I think one-on-one -on -one time. I think the biggest thing's time. You know, you know, a young man walks through the door, you have no idea what his day is like. Your right. girlfriend might have broke up with him. Parents might have gotten on about something. He might have class. class issues. I mean, there's so many different things that they're bringing to the practice that you've got to kind of unpack that before they head on the court. And if you're not on top of it, then you're frustrated in practice because you're not getting the most out of it. And we all know once you leave a practice, you can't get that back. So spend more time one-on-one -on -one with your players and make sure they're mentally where they need to be. You kind of just hit on this. Um, talk about things that the players control: their girlfriend, parents, the way they've been mm -hmm. treated, their background. Um, and I, I've noticed this about you. You you kind of pick your spots on the on the sideline as far as official calls and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. You don't let those things bother you. Your response time. Mm -hmm. You hit pause and you just move on. You don't waste a lot of effort. How do you train? How do you get the, your kids to buy into that too, where they're not worried about things that are. Yeah, I, I think as a leader, um, you're modeling. So, you know, if, if you got a group that, that you really trust, then, then when you walk in, they're going to read your body language, they're going to read how you react to things, and they're going to play off that. Okay, we all do. Yeah. Okay, it's, we do, We play off our parents and how they are when they walk through the door after work. Yeah. Um, so I try to make sure there's a consistency level. I try to make sure that we always feel like we're in control. Um, I always feel like we're confident in our preparation. And then, you know, the, th the comment that we use, Kenny, is we're going to make the right play because we had great preparation to make the right play, and then we're going to live with the result. We're going like, to live with the result. If we miss the shot, if we make the shot, we're okay because we made the right play. And uh, as a coach, I think that's the way you have to react on the sideline, at least it depends on what kind of, what kind of team you have. Right, absolutely. Good. Um, so... I'm just reading this one off here that I have. So there's an old cliche out there. You've probably heard of it, whether the percentage is right or not, that the uh, game is 90% mental, 10% physical. Um, although that ratio is true now, we can agree that players need to be mentally tough. And I know that toughness is one of your core values. Um, is there a percentage or any – how do you look at the word toughness, you know, with, with your team? So we define toughness as physical and mental. And physical toughness has its limits, meaning – if I were to take a hammer and knock your hand, eventually your, your hand's not going to be able to function, okay? Mental toughness is unlimited, okay? So your mental toughness, now where, where does mental toughness show up at? You do have to be physically tough to be mentally tough. I think there's levels of that. But mental toughness shows up in having to get up to go to work every day. Mental toughness shows up in a myriad of different ways. Uh, what's your breaking point? I'm, I'm tired. I'm not playing well. Coach is on me. Uh, I'm hot. I'm cold. You know, whatever it may be, if you get consumed with those feelings and emotions, you're at your breaking point. If you can push beyond that, then you're in a situation where your, your mental toughness increases. I tell a story all the time. There, there's, there's two boxers, and, and they're, they're fighting. And, I mean, it's 10th round, and they're just hammering each other. It's, it's like a, it's like a, back, it's, 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 it's a low-rent district flight. Like, it's not on the TV, right? So they're just banging each other and going back and forth and back and forth. And finally guy just knocks the guy out right so they go back to the locker room and it's a raggedy locker room where there's only like a, a sheet like a sheet between the locker room and the, the guy who won is crying 
and the manager comes up to him and says, you know, why are you crying? Why are you crying? He, it was awesome. He goes, uh, it was unbelievable. He said, I told myself if he punches me one more time, I'm done. If he just hits me one more time, I'm done. And he didn't hit me one more time. And, and the guy heard it and he broke down crying knowing if he had just punched one more time, he was done. It's mental toughness, yeah. right? Where, where can you go to take yourself there? Yeah, that's great. That's good. Uh, you know, so mental toughness and something I've, I, that makes sense to me, you got mental toughness and emotional resiliency. All right, so two kind of different things. Mm -hmm. um, where do you, you know, so I guess just emotional resiliency, how is that, is that something you discuss with your team any sort of way? Because that's something that, especially I guess within a practice or a game when you're in heat of the moment, you know, something that, you know, you know, your blood's boiling a little bit and it's, you know, sometimes it's not as even as much mentally tough. It's how can you handle that split second yeah. when something happens? How can you handle that? Is that something that you... We don't talk, you know, we talk about emotional intelligence. Maybe that's how we phrase it. Okay. We don't really talk that much about it, but I think that's probably for a coach as, as much as anybody and also for the players. You know, can you handle... There's a right time for everything. And... You know, when you're fired up as a coach, sometimes the right time is to lay into your team. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the right time is you want to, it's going to make you feel better, but you got to pull back. Mm -hmm. And that's emotional intelligence. Okay. And, uh, and I think players gain emotional intelligence through their coach and through just becoming older and more experienced. I think, you know, if you look back on it and you, you realize how more emotionally intelligent you are now than you were when you were younger and how much better you could have been at both as a player and a coach. So I don't know if there's exercise you can do, George. Uh, I just think you got to be cognizant of it, and it tends to show up a little bit more maybe when you're the go-go-to guy or the coach because it can influence so many other people. Okay, that's good. Do you have a couple of players on your team that every year that you feel like that are, um, you know, when things aren't going, you know, well or whatever the situation may be, that are coaches in a locker room for you? For, out of, for the players? On the good teams. On the good teams. You know, it's an easy saying, but I like saying it, you know. On bad teams, nobody leads. On good teams, coaches lead. On great teams, the player leads. So how do we create ownership? You know, we we'll create ownership every day in drills. How do we create more ownership of the players? I tell my guys all the time, our best teams, or when we were playing our best, is when I get out of the way. Mm -hmm. And those guys take ownership of the team, and they, they, they see what's going on, and they make the proper corrections. Those are what elite teams do. Right, right. I, I noticed this uh, as, a, as a younger coach. Um, I was talking too much in practice, and I wasn't allowing my guys – to, to be the ones talking. I'm telling them talk, 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 but I'm the one who's talking. Yeah. And, and when I realized I started to be a little bit more quiet, um, how quiet it was in the gym because I wasn't mm -hmm. teaching them properly. I'm telling them, but I'm not teaching them. So how, how do you go about giving them specific things to say mm -hmm. and say the right things? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, how do you get an assistance involved in that? And what's yeah. the balance there? So we, we, have a, we say you can't have accountability before, you have clarity before accountability. You can't hold somebody accountable unless they first have clarity, okay? So clarity comes in the reps and the teaching piece of it. So hold them accountable once they have clarity. Clarity means understanding what they're saying. So coach, there are two, there's two reasons teams, guys, teams don't communicate. Fear or they don't know what to say, okay? Eliminate the fear through repetition. Figure out what to say once you have clarity, right? So positional clarity, and you know, we, we call it defensively, you know, speak what you see. The other thing we do is we have we have no talk drills where we have drills in practice where the coaches aren't allowed to say a word. All right, yeah. or we have a, we we start practice with what we call scream it, where we put them in a defensive drill and they have to scream out every screen. So that's how we start practice. That's great. So different things like that to incorporate their voices instead of ours. Every defensive drill we do we do as a team instead of breaking up. Now what are you doing by coming as a team instead of breaking up? You're sacrificing what repetition. A lot of repetition. We'll sacrifice repetition for ownership because the guy on the baseline got to have to take ownership of the drill. So that, that's what we do. You know, I, I don't know if it works, but it's, it's worked for us for a period of time, and yeah. that's kind of our focus. Yeah. That's good. I think it's also important as a coach when you come to practice, you know, like people need to come and be like, you have to have your own language. Mm -hmm. Like your assistants, because you, know, you got to speak in headlines as a coach. Mm -hmm. It's basketball. We don't huddle up after every play. So everything's got to be spoken headlines. And if you have, a, you have a language in your organization 
that you know what this word means and what this word means, then you can speak in headlines consistently. And any good practice you go to, go to an NBA practice, and you'll walk out of there ha half not knowing what they said yeah. because they have their own language. Yeah. You talked about huddling up. Um, I, I've heard this about you. I, uh, I, I know you're in Alabama, obviously. Um, your practices are very similar, not necessarily the drills, but the way they're formatted at Saban. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak on that a little bit and the influence you had just observing a guy who's you know elite yeah. as far as getting results and, the, and focusing on the process and getting those results? I, th I think football coaches they have, they are the best at it because I think what they do is they take a huge organization and they're efficient in everything they do. They're efficient, uh, organized. Uh, we call it quality control. That's what we got it from our quality control. Every day is our everyday office control. Everybody has responsibilities. Everybody attacks those responsibilities. Everybody's held accountable to those responsibilities. So in practice, each coach has something that they're watching. So when their voice is heard, they know that one of the coach, well, I must not have blocked out because he's, 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 he's saying something. You know, for me, I'm seeing everything. The coaches have specific things that they see. You know, we want to we want to hit drills. We want to get as much as we can out, and then we want to move on and get things done we need to get done. We want to be very specific. We want to be very detailed. And when you have that, practices flow a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. um, so I've taken more from Alabama football in terms of the process of the office and process of building a program. But the practice itself is the responsibilities and accountabilities of your coaches in practice and making sure that they they're held to that standard. Okay. That's good. Um, I heard the quote before. Uh, there's um, a lot of like young players, or not just young players, just players in general, have a stronger want ethic than a work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about, I guess, kids? I know you mentioned a little bit before, but kids coming in, um, you know, they really want to play at UC. They really want to be a successful player in college, and but they're not. They're, they're not ready, and mm -hmm. um, or maybe their expectations are unrealistic, or maybe they're just not ready mentally. Whatever it may be. Um, so I guess my question is: is what is you what is your advice to junior, senior, in high school who's really talented? What do what is the next step that they need to be ready for when they do get to college? Out of, above almost anything else. Well, can? I would first say that emotion fades and passion sustains. And what I mean by that is the emotion of being excited about a game or about practice or about being a player somewhere that's going to fade. Okay, that's human nature. Okay. But passion doesn't fade, that's sustained. So are you passionate about what you do, first and foremost? And then, is like anything else, how do you handle adversity? I, I promise parents two things in a, in, in a family. I'm going to love your son, and we're going to go through adversity. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're going to build trust, because we're going to have to go through it together, and we're going to go through a lot of adversity as a freshman. So how you handle those things, but it goes back to they're going to get over a long period of time all of a sudden. So if it's a talented player, if he had all that figured out, then he wouldn't need you. You don't need a coach. So... You know, the balancing act for a coach is the mentorship, coaching, commanding. Early in a career, it should be mentorship should be the high percentage. Coaching should be the next percentage. And commanding should be the smallest amount you do. Now, if they get to the point where they're a junior and a senior and they still haven't figured it out, then you got to flip it. And you got to go command, coach, and a little bit of mentoring. And uh, that's the process we take. That's it. I like that. That's really good. That's good. You talk about maybe... Go ahead. Uh, have you, did you kind of come up, what is, is that something that you came up with? You feel like, hey, as you're coaching? There's not a single involved? thing that I've said today that I've come up with myself. <laughs> right? No. Yeah. I have no original ideas. Right. These are all well, stuff that I've, these are all I'm stuff I've learned, learned, I've stolen. I mean, the mentors well, that well, I have. you start using that? Is that something that the, you I work with the military group. It's, it's, it's actually the military. It's, it's what the military does. That's what, okay. That's, that's cool. this. So I, I've learned all these things and then you put them into practice and you find out what works for you and what doesn't. But, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, no original ideas here. Right, right. Well, that's awesome. I wish there was. Yeah. That's awesome. yeah. That's I like, like, that's like everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> that's everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah, kind of last, last question here, yeah. um, just wrapping it up. You talked a lot about culture and establishing that. It is a buzzword. You know, everybody yeah. wants to have a great culture. Um, and, and you've hit on this a little bit, but how do you move from, you know, being, being a lead program that, that is... Um, in a transitional phase right now and establishing your culture. Um, and, and what does that look like to you? What, what is the perfect John Brandon culture? That yeah. you want to I think the best culture you have is a culture that you never talk about, but you feel it when you're there. So if you were to come visit our practice, if I've got to talk about our culture, we don't have one. Uh, what we started doing is we started taking the water cooler and putting it right next to the recruits 
because when guys are go to drink they're sweating they're mad at each other they're they're emotional and at that moment you're gonna see what our culture is yeah. and our culture is so good i wanted to see that now where i'm at now i have to take my own advice and say get it over a long period of time all of a sudden right so we're not there yet from a culture standpoint even though tremendous you know just from for my culture i'm not saying from a culture standpoint in general just the one that i want to build yep. and um you know it takes time yeah. but to, 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 to tell you kenny what it looks like it would look like our core values and it would guys would be held accountable and part of having a culture is you don't have fear of repercussion and judgment when i hold you accountable so if i hold you accountable something i don't have to worry about you snapping back at me or if we really have trust, I can make the same mistake I'm holding you accountable for. I made the same mistake five minutes ago. But if we have real trust, I can call you out on it and understand that we both got to get better. Absolutely. One random question here, kind of really off topic, but uh, flashback to March um, when Drew had that game winner heading into the uh, conference finals. Mm -hmm. uh, what was, uh, was that the set? Drew slipping the screen, mm -hmm. just kind of popping. And that was, was that option number one, or was that option kind of... There's three options on that play, and uh, it's like anything else. You put your, try to put your best players in a position, and then you, you, you let them make decisions. And there was, three, there was three options on the play, and uh, the best players made the best decisions. Yeah, 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 I did. Yeah, that's, that's what happens when you have a good culture. <laughs> get the results. Good players. Good. We appreciate it, Coach. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, good luck this year. Thanks. Really do appreciate it. So. Honored to be here. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. Right. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you.